Okay, thank you. Okay, so the uh, time is five o'clock and I will call the Committee of Whole to order. And with that, the uh, first item that we have is approval of the October 20th, 2020 uh, minutes. And uh, Councillor Abatoye, you would be up for the first motion. Would you like to put that on? Yes, I'll make a motion that um, Council approves the Committee of the Whole meeting of October 20th as presented and circulated. Thank you. Are there any errors or omissions? And I'll just look for hands if there are. Not seeing any. Okay, I'll close the motion. Please cast your vote on the October 20th, 2020 Council meeting uh, minutes as presented. Thank you. That is carried unanimously, thank you. Uh, we do not have any delegations who have registered for this evening, pre-registered. So our first item of business is a presentation by Strata Development. So we have Andrew Usnick, partner from Strata Development Corp, uh, who will be joining us. So Andrew, if you would like to come on. Just wanna test my mic to see if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you fine. So we have about 20 minutes set up for your uh, presentation. So I will let you take it away. And then after your presentation, I'll open it up to council for questions. Okay. Great. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm presenting tonight to introduce two concepts that we will soon be bringing to council. I'm going to move fairly quick to allow for as much time as possible for questions. I've heard three clear priorities from this council when it comes to new housing product, meeting the region's density objectives, providing affordable housing options and expanding parking options. These priorities are levers that often come at a cost to one another. However, we believe we have two concepts that enhance all three. And I'll start with our DC 15 proposal. Our proposed DC 15 is located directly adjacent to the South Fort Meadows Pond and stage 3B Lots in this part of the community are mostly single family lots. In previous stages, we found that the market pushed back against purchasing large or even smaller single family houses backing onto a busy collector or arterial road. For that reason, the concept we assumed we would eventually build is shown here. Transition from larger single family lots to smaller single family lots and eventually to duplex product backing directly onto South Ridge Boulevard. Our proposed DC 15 still has large single family product backing onto the pond and across the street, but we found a way to expand our offering for single family lots south of that while still proposing a housing product backing onto Southridge Boulevard, we believe will be accepted by the market. Starting on the north side of the road, the lots contained within the block label DC 15 B would mirror the R1 zoning for single family lots with two key additions. First, we would increase the minimum width to 13 meters to make sure all lots are large single family lots. Second, we would add a regulation to cap the driveway width at the property line to be 6.2 meters. This would allow people to still do a triple car garage with a curved driveway inside their property. More importantly though, this would create an unprecedented amount of unobstructed space on the road for parking and snow storage. On the south side of the road, the lots contained within DC 15A would be the first front attached urban character product, referred to as zero lot line in different municipalities. The previously approved DC only applied to rear detached urban character product. This product functions the same as duplex, same land intensity, and often the same floor plan from builders, just without the shared wall. This product, the same as duplex, comes with limited street parking. As a result, we're proposing to increase the minimum front setback from six meters to seven meters to ensure that every driveway can fit an oversized truck without impeding the adjacent sidewalk. Now, normally increasing the front setback would come at the cost of a homeowner's backyard. However, these lots have a unique opportunity to justify the increase. In the land use bylaw, the minimum lot depth is 34 meters. Bound by the existing pond and proposed road, these lots will be extremely deep regardless of the housing product, 
ranging from 39 meters to 66 meters deep. Adding one meter to the driveway will not have an adverse impact on these particular lots. They will have some of the largest backyards in the city. To ensure a pleasing streetscape, we've included additional provisions in the DC that require a higher level of variation between these units. We will also require a percentage of habitable space directly above the garage so that the front elevation is not dominated solely by a garage door. The result will be something we think is more attractive than duplex. Both sides of the road will still have boulevards to ensure a green streetscape. So to circle back, this illustration shows the street parking and snow storage of the original concept. As well, I've included a photo of Richmond Link in South Fort Ridge Stage 4, a subdivision that was constructed a few years ago across the street. The housing product built on Richmond Link was the same what we were originally contemplating for the area. Next, we have an illustration showing the impact of changing the duplex product on the south side of the road to urban character. There is no doubt that any doubt dense housing product means limitations for street parking and snow storage. However, urban character has the same land intensity as duplex product. So while the housing product is different, the implications for street parking and snow storage are essentially the same. Fort Saskatchewan has for many decades built duplex products successfully and there would be no additional challenges in this application. Finally, I wanna compare it to our proposal. As you can see, there is nearly triple the road parking opportunities on the north side of the road. And that same frontage will be available for snow storage along the boulevards in the winter. While it's tough to identify in the illustration, I also want to mention the extra meter of driveway length on the south side of the road that will provide better on-site parking opportunities. We believe this proposal not only provides a great example of innovative development to the region, but it outperforms what will be achieved by simply following the existing zonings in the land use bylaw. Next, I want to move to DC-16. Our proposed DC-16 is located across the street from the South Fort Meadows Park that will be constructed this year. The location provides a large opportunity because the park will be the primary recreation space for adjacent residents, and both sides of the road will be unobstructed for street parking with no driveways fronting onto the road. The unique design for these lots is reducing the depth to 22.5 meters. The reduction in depth is to allow for a rear attached garage on the proposed units in lieu of a backyard space. This is the proposed floor plan for the unit. The rear attached garage would connect to the rear lane through a concrete apron, and the house would front onto the adjacent sidewalk. There would be no backyard on these units. We're very excited about being able to offer a 22 by 22 rear attached garage. This would be unprecedented for duplex product in Fort Saskatchewan, as this garage size is larger than most of the garages we see on larger single family houses. We have superimposed two Ford F-350 Super Duty trucks to scale to drawing to illustrate that these garages fit the largest vehicle options on the market. The, the builder has provided renders of the product he is hoping to build. Similar to a townhouse project, units would have a consistent and complementary front elevation. Of the many enhancements the builder is proposing, the front po porch is the most noticeable. With the South Fort Meadows Park directly adjacent to these units, this provides a large opportunity for a private gathering space that still allows community engagement, a pillar of the new NDP. The builder has proposed to complete these units with zero scape landscaping treatments, such as artificial turf, mulch, trees, and shrubs. This means the homeowner would have no regular outdoor maintenance requirements, no need for owning a lawnmower. The builder is proposing to have two trees and 10 shrubs on private property, far exceeding the one tree per property required in development agreements. This will result in a lush green streetscape. The South Fort Meadows outline plan currently shows this area as townhouse product. Despite moving from townhouse product to duplex, the reduced depth allows us to create four additional units to the east, which results in a net increase in density. So to summarize, the zero scape option will be very appealing to many purchasers who do not value having a backyard or front yard to maintain. In terms of council's goal, we think this checks all the boxes. We increase the density despite moving to a larger housing product. We provide the largest garage for starter product available in Fort Saskatchewan. And finally, our builder feels he will be able to deliver this product 
at a more affordable price than any other housing product in our South Fort Meadows neighborhood. With that, I'll be happy to answer questions and I can share my screen once again uh, if there's anything that needs an illustration. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so we will go to questions and this is uh, just really clarifying questions of Andrew because this will be coming forward at a future council meeting for um, a first reading. So Councillor Abatoye, you're first. Thank you for your presentation, Andrew. Um, I like the fact that you started with council's priorities, parking, density and affordability. Great, but to question. Um, so DC 16, um, so you're reducing the debts of the, of the, of the of the place and um and i'm wondering like i've never seen a house without a backyard so what's that going to look like well you're absolutely right one of the things that is the most exciting and also terrifying thing about this product is we'd be pro proposing something completely unique to the region but also the, it's not even found anywhere around here is there anywhere close by that that sort of building will be located there is certain uh, units I can think of right now in West Mountain Edmonton that would have a, a similar build, so we could definitely provide those pictures. Maybe I can explain the 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 idea behind the product. Um, obviously, many different people choose to live in apartment or condo buildings, and those units don't have a yard. They have usually just a balcony space as their amenity, um, but they choose to live there regardless. And through COVID, what we've seen is a lot of people are thinking about living in housing products where they don't need to be in the same building as multiple families as a consideration. So what we've thought as what would be a good approach to the market here is we know already people live in units that don't have backyards in those condos and apartments. So it's reasonable to assume that there is a market for, for units without that. What comes to mind for us, especially because of the zero scaped concept is market segments like plant workers who are away from their house for weeks at a time and don't want to have to worry about maintaining a property when they're not there. Downsizers who just don't have the desire to maintain a yard as well and may potentially go somewhere warmer during the, uh, the winter. Or even something like single parents where they have want a recreation space for their children, which would be directly across the street in a 10 acre park, but they just don't have the time or necessarily des the desire to maintain another recreation space on their own property. So um, it, it's definitely unique. And, and I can't say we have any proof that the market is going to, to jump to this, but we're, we're hopeful and confident. Okay, thank you. Um, so my second question is um, just um, regarding the same DC-60, you're going from townhouses to duplexes and the number of um, housing is um, houses is going is to increase. How is that even possible? So the, the reason for the increase is along that specific block, the number of units goes down from 19 to 18, but because of the reduced depth, there's four additional units created to the east in a future development. So the net oh, increase is three. One. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Harris, you're next. Uh, Andrew, um, just a good product. I like it. <clears throat> I think it, uh, it has some novel uh, approach to our community. Um, with the DC 16 product, um, so you've got two capacity for large trucks in the back, no backyard. Uh, basically, it's it's total building on the lot, correct? That's correct. The site coverage would be much higher than what you'd see out of typical product. Okay. How many uh, parking spots would generally be in front of the um, of the units uh, on that street, whatever it's called? Um, future future collector. <laughs> what a beautiful name for a road. Um, yeah. With the width being uh, 26 feet per unit uh, or per, per lot, you would expect to see parking for two normal cars, um, but not two oversized trucks as well in front. So I don't think you can have a half truck, but by the math of it, 
for every two units, you'd probably be able to fit three trucks in the front of it or four then, conventional cars. And then snow storage would be on the boulevard across the street adjacent to the park. Exactly. Across the street in the park, we're also planning a, a, a large asphalt trail um, with, with a, a fairly large uh, landscape boulevard. So in our discussions with engineering and public works, what is being contemplated, but by all means not finalized at this point, is, is blading over to the west side of the road. Great. Okay, Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, Andrew. I really don't have uh, too many, if any, questions. I have a question for you, though. In the uh, DC-16 uh, proposed units, you've got two Ford F-350s on a 22 by 22 pad in the back. I'm sorry, uh, on a pad in the back. Could you fit those two, 20, those two uh, F-350s inside that 22 by 22 garage? Yes, and sorry, just to be clear, my illustration uh, was of a garage. There, there's no pad in the back. Oh, yes, see. you'd be able to fit those vehicles in there. Uh, I wouldn't call it a luxurious experience in terms no. of uh, uh, jumping across, but but I also uh, would say um, while we recognize, or at least I recognize, that vehicle options in, the Fort, Saskat in Fort Saskatchewan are bigger than other municipalities, but yep. that being said, when we're talking about an F-350 Super Duty, the number of households that owe two of them, yeah, no, that's a smaller remote. sliver for sure. Very remote. You're right. You're right. Very right. Um, you know, I like both products. Actually, I see for myself. Uh, you know, one of them might fit for me in the in the nearer future. The the DC16 product. The other is, uh, I think, uh, kind of unique. I think it uh, it would be of interest uh, broadly. It's a really nice family product. But I, I appreciate that comment. Um, we're, we're certainly excited about it because we think with that DC-15, we found a way to build a better mousetrap. Yeah, I have no more questions. Okay, thank you. I'm next on the speaking order. Um, so just a question with regards to that, um, with the, uh, the DC-15, so that's front garage, is there sidewalks anywhere in in this area or is it going to be on this walking on the street or what's no on dc 15 the cross section of the road would be the exact same as you'd see anywhere else for any other product so there'd be sidewalks on both sides of the road okay and uh the other question that i had um on the side that you had, we're making it wider and allowing for a triple car garage. Um, I'm assuming there would be caveats on how wide they can actually make their um, their driveway entrance into there. Because what we see in, in future times after caveats are taken off is people will go in and then put in a whole bunch more concrete, which then takes up the, uh, takes up the parking area in the front. Yeah, so I, I maybe administration offline would be able to ask this better, but to my knowledge, in the existing land use bylaw, there's not specific language regulating the width of your driveway, which is why you see some of those changes after the fact. Whereas in this case, we would actually be embedding that language in the DC zoning that is basically carrying on in perpetuity. So there wouldn't be an opportunity for someone to buy a house as a second owner and then add that on because it's actually in the bylaw that says you cannot do that. Whereas I think with conventional zonings, I don't think that's the case. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lennox. Thanks for your presentation, Andrew. Um, so I'm just wondering for the D16 product, you said that there is no precedent that this is something entirely new. So I guess I'm just wondering if you can, provide a little bit more insight as to the reasoning behind going with that particular product and why we chose Fort Saskatchewan to kind of make that debut possibly. Well, in all of our communities, we really strive to do something different. It, it's the creative part of the job, is the exciting part of the job, is always trying to do something better instead of just repeating the same thing over and over again. Um, 
the reason that we picked this area was really deliberate because it faces on to this giant park amenity. I'll be the first to say that I don't think these particular applications work wherever you want them to go. But specifically because it fronts onto the park, it was two really important considerations for us. Number one, we knew that there was public parking on both sides of the road, which was a big factor. But number two is having that amenity so close to your front door, like the park itself is as close to your front door as your backyard would be. So at least then, I think the market will be more accepting of not having a backyard because they'll be able to see and touch and feel that park amenity so close to them. Whereas if this housing product was even tucked around the corner and you didn't physically see the park and it wasn't that close, I would be a little more nervous about the market, market accepting this or not. So, so really what it came down to is we thought we had a unique opportunity with this park and we figured let's do something different and exciting. And, and, you know, Hopefully it works in terms of the market acceptance, but even if the market doesn't accept it, what we're really excited about the fact is we think it's going to be a really beautiful product and this being a signature street in our community, having a beautiful product is, is very important towards our, our broader goals. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I have to say that I'm usually the skeptic of these types of um, housing uh, products and I get nervous about builders um, and the real estate mar market driving the housing market. But I have to say I'm quite impressed um, and I just uh, have a lot of respect for the creativity um, that this product or both products do show. And I think that you have um, met the bar and, and quite frankly raised the bar. So um, yeah, great presentation. Thank you. I really appreciate those words. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Macon. Thanks for your presentation, Andrew. Uh, I know this, this is our question period, but I think all of my questions have been answered. And I really think this is an innovative development. I, I do really like both of these products, and I look forward to discussing it more when it comes back to a regular council meeting. So thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. And good evening, Andrew. Uh, I get to speak last, so most of my questions have been addressed. Uh, Mayor Catcher caught one of them. So my skepticism over smaller housing pockets is, is being gradually eroded as I, uh, during my term on council. How's the success of the zero lot lines in, in um, or adjacent close to where we live, south of South Fork? I rode past on my bike probably a dozen times last summer, and they, they looked good. How have they been accepted by the market? Uh, I'm not saying this just to cherry pick it, but it has been the most successful housing product we've ever seen in our community, and that includes during the oil boom years. Um, you know, people talk about the market in the sense of, of, of COVID, and that is a very real concern, um, but we just had one of the strongest years we've ever had in Fort Saskatchewan in terms of sales. And it really was driven by the success of that product. So um, I still think it's early days. Uh, you know, there's, I, I know Public Works is really hoping to see a full season of that product uh, in, in motion to see how things work. But uh, I, I'm an advocate for that particularly particular product being added to the land use bylaw as a full-time uh, product. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you think that it, it looks and functions well. And I hope when we have enough time to kind of really take a, an examination of it as a group, I hope council uh, agrees with that because it's, it's been a really strong success for us so far. Okay, thank you and good. I think that it, the, the test of the pudding will be a decade down the road when we, we see how the, the neighborhoods mature. Uh, but, but certainly right now they look fine. Seven meter driveway that you referenced, the seven meters doesn't encroach on a sidewalk or wouldn't be expected to encroach on any sidewalk? That's correct. The property line or private property starts where the sidewalk ends. So by increasing the front setback, you essentially force the building to increase the length of the driveway as well. 
So again, when we're talking about something that's a, a little more dense, and, and we're aware of the fact that there are people who, who drive larger trucks in Fort Saskatchewan, and who would park on their driveway, but perhaps their truck is too long for that, we know we've alleviated that possibility by making this design change. And it's not necessarily something that I would advocate in all housing forms, but as I mentioned in the presentation, because we have such a humongous amount of depth on these lots, there really is no downside. So, so why wouldn't we do that to give ourselves that science, extra protection? And I agree, thank you. Um, Andrew, one last question or comment. The, the renderings for DC-16, they're very good, but I assume they're not photos, that they're, they're artist renderings? Correct, those are artist yeah. renderings based on, on the designs that the builder had been working on. Okay, uh, and the builder's planning on flat roof concept? Uh, that roof isn't actually a flat roof. It's, uh, it's kind of a mid center. It's uh, a modern farmhouse. So it's a, it's a much lower slope, but it isn't an actual full flat roof. I think, I think the, the, the pictures that you see, because you're looking up at the houses okay. and you can see, I, I think really what the builder wanted to demonstrate with that aspect of the rendering was showcasing the fact that one of the one of the premiums he put in the rendering was uh, a wood grain uh, soffit underneath the roof, which is again a, a premium feature that we don't see very often. So I, I think that's kind of what uh, what would skews the uh, the the pardon me the uh, the pitch of the roof, but uh, certainly. When we come to council, it'll be easy enough for me to get another rendering from another aspect just to better show that uh, roof line. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I'm not a, obviously not a builder nor an engineer, but flat roofs in, in this climate could be problematic. Uh, and that was my concern. So maybe you could address that a little bit when, we, when you come back next time. And uh, thank you. Appreciate the presentation. It looks good. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to look. Does anybody need a second round of questions? Not seeing anybody. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think it's uh, really important when you can come to Committee of the Whole and be able to answer some of these questions. Um, I know this is coming up uh, fairly soon, I think, at one of our next meetings uh, for first reading. So uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, online once again. So thank thanks so much for all your time and, and thoughtful questions. And I'll see you all soon and hopefully see you all in person very soon as well. That would be nice. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. OK, the uh, next item that we have is the environmental sustainability initiatives. And I would invite Sadie Miller uh, to join us. I believe you're presenting. There you are. I am. I'm just going to share my screen here. Just checking technology really quickly. Can you guys see the screen and hear me? We can, thank you. Perfect. All right, good evening, your worship and council. My name is Sadie Miller and I'll be speaking to you tonight about environmental sustainability in the city of Fort Saskatchewan. It was passed by council on February 11th, 2020, directing administration to provide a report on sustainability initiatives that are currently taking place within the city, as well as any future initiatives that could be implemented or explored. When exploring environmental sustainability, I focused on five broad categories, including land, transportation, waste, water, and energy and climate. Despite the city of Fort Saskatchewan not having a centralized position or division to manage environmental programs, you will see throughout the report and this presentation that staff across several departments in the city have taken initiative and found more innovative and sustainable ways of doing business. Our parks crew have, to, have committed to low impact maintenance of our parks through sustainable pest management strategies, which is governed by our integrated pest management program administrative policy. This prioritizes the use of environmentally safe pest eradication measures, such as the noxious weed-eating goats that you see pictured here. 
Two pollinator gardens have been established in the city, which encourage native plant growth that help attract and feed local bee populations. The parks team has also set up cigarette butt collection stations, which help prevent harmful chemicals from entering the environment and allows packaging, remaining tobacco, and filter plastics to be composted or recycled. Our parks team also collects rainwater from our Peter Schmidt mechanic shop using rain barrels and uses this to water flower arrangements throughout the city. Saskatchewan has an extensive trail network which provides safe and well-maintained trails for sustainable transportation such as biking and walking. Our river valley trails and naturalized areas provide much needed corridors for wildlife and areas where native vegetation can thrive. We've established several waste diversion programs across the city including our residential Fort Sask Waste Program as well as diverse opportunities and staff occupied facilities. This transition to more sustainable waste management practices has resulted in nearly 60% of our residential waste being diverted to either an organics or recycling processing facility. Fort Saskatchewan staff have also partnered with local industry to create mutually beneficial sustainability programs. One of these programs is the ATCO Hydrogen Blending Project, which uses new technology to decrease the emissions produced from residential natural gas use. Fort Saskatchewan staff are exploring partnerships when it comes to a circular economy system. So a circular economy aims to manufacture products that can continue to be reused, repaired, or repurposed within our system, rather than importing goods, using them once or twice, and then throwing them away. Given Fort Saskatchewan's industry base, we feel we're in a good position to be a leader in this area. Administration is in the very early stages of discussing, discussing this potential with local industries, and we hope to be able to share some good news with Council in the future. So potential initiatives outlined in the report were inspired by other municipalities who have successfully implemented similar projects. For example, the City of Leduc has made a point to make their internal operations more sustainable by purchasing a hybrid vehicle for their environment staff and prioritizing the use of post-consumer and sustainably sourced materials for new building construction. The photo on the right here shows all of the furniture and features of Leduc's new eco-station building that were sourced or constructed locally and sustainably. Fort Saskatchewan could mimic this commitment, but by specifying a certain percentage of post-consumer materials be used in new buildings wherever it's applicable, or by purchasing and installing electric vehicle charging stations at facilities. We could take these initiatives one step further and use these sustainable investments to apply for a green building certification and be publicly recognized for this commitment. So some communities have established zero waste events with provisions in place to eliminate single use plastics using hydrant fountains or bulk water trailers. The hydrant fountain on the left is used by the City of Calgary during community events, providing drinking water directly out of the hydrant. The trailer on the right is filled using municipal water supplies and allows event attendees to fill up their water bottle for free. Not only do these systems help reduce waste, but they can also be an effective tool to educate community members on regional water systems. I show this with optimism that systems like these will be able to be used again in the future once the pandemic is over. A hot topic in most communities is stormwater management facilities. Pictured here on the left is a Strathcona County educational board that is stationed near Regency Stormwater Pond. This is a passive tool that helps educate the community on the importance and purpose of these facilities, as well as some of the native flora and fauna that frequent them. Communities across the region have tailored their education to households close to these facilities and use them to explain things such as the effects of excessive fertilizer use on water quality, the importance of naturalized ponds in helping to reduce sedimentation, and the negative impacts of releasing invasive species such as goldfish into these facilities. The photo on the right is a self-audit energy toolkit that the City of St. Albert rents out to community members. These toolkits include technologies that will allow residents to see where energy or water is being used in their home and show opportunities to increase their home's efficiency. In these St. Albert kits specifically, they include tools such as uh, a drip gauge to help identify leaky faucets, infrared thermometers to identify areas that aren't properly insulated, and a meter to measure the electricity being used by appliances. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Okay, thank you very much. I have, uh, if you can put your presentation down so everybody can come up. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harris, you're first. Uh, Sadie, I think it was a good presentation. Thanks. It was good to see what we're doing. Um, obviously, there's lots that, uh, that can be done, and I'm glad we're moving in the right direction. Um, uh, I saw something recently on, um, uh, and this maybe isn't relative to ours, but I think we're probably doing it from a recycling standpoint, maybe Ed's involved in this. The producer responsibility for packaging and recycling and whatnot, has there been any uh, anything recently happened with that? Is that moving in the right direction? Through your worship, it is definitely moving in the right direction. I actually debated including it in the report, but figured it's not really an initiative that's in the city of Fort Saskatchewan's hands at this point. Uh, so what's happening with that is the province has actually agreed to look at it uh, due to all of the advocacy from municipalities across the province. And it does sound like we are going to start seeing some engagement requests in 2021 and a formation of some kind of regulation in 2022. Yeah, does, does the city or does the municipality along those lines, does the city end up having some responsibility to create space for that sort of recycling opportunity or is it totally back to the retailer to recycle, say, packaging or whatever. I ask that just so insofar as how we're integrating those things in as we do our own recycling um, improvements, you know, to uh, the transfer station, things of that nature. Yeah, it definitely varies. So you see some systems like the British Columbia government has made a 100% EPR program. So that would take all responsibility. <clears throat> well, sorry, all responsibility off of the municipality's plate and put it all on the manufacturer's plate. 100% of the cost, 100% of the collection and processing will be passed down to those manufacturers. Uh, other provinces such as Ontario have a 60 to 80%. So some of that responsibility gets passed down, but we still have control over uh, the collection of the material, where it goes, who collects it, our contracts, things like that. So I think that's what these engagement um sessions are going to try to address in 2021 so i do think the city of fort saskatchewan and all municipalities in alberta will have to evaluate what kind of system they want and put their thoughts forward to the province for a final decision okay thanks for that report and i guess thanks to councillor abatoye for bringing it up way back when so at least i recall so thanks a lot okay thank you councillor sperling Thanks for the presentation, Sadie. There's a ton of information in this when you start going through all the links that you've provided in here. It's amazing. Um, so if you had to pick one thing right now for the city of Fort Saskatchewan that you'd like to see the city move forward on, what would it be in terms of, of this area? Through your worship, uh, not to be biased as the waste program supervisor, but I do think we're already headed in a positive direction with waste. We've already made those commitments. They're already in our business plans. Uh, if we are gonna focus on one thing, I would say let's go full tilt with the waste reduction strategies, which would include, you know, multi-unit commercial, industrial, and construction waste diversion, which uh, for the most part the region has not touched yet. Okay. Just one other uh, comment or or question. The the idea of us installing a, a recharging station in Fort Saskatchewan for a vehicle. Um, I have no idea what the cost of that would be, but is what do you think of that as an initiative for the city? I think it would be positive. There was actually a push a couple of years ago from an organization who was trying to build um, basically a whole region where you could travel around to every city and come to a, a hybrid charging station. So you could drive your electric vehicle anywhere in the Edmonton region and have a reliable fueling source. Um, there are also grants available for things like that. So the MCC, the Municipal Climate Change Action Center, provides grants for things like that, I believe. Uh, they range in price depending on how quickly you want your vehicle to charge. So I think there's three tier systems, the lowest being a car charges in 24 hours, and then the third, the most efficient, being a vehicle charges fully in three hours. And that's okay. the price range. Right. I see a vehicle, actually electric vehicles working in the Edmonton metro region. I see that as a big opportunity. Um, and incidentally, they actually have two charging stations out at Elk Island Park. 
Which yeah, I and I've noticed cool. some schools are also putting them in their parking lots as well more frequently. Right on. Thank you, Sadie. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple of questions. So pre-COVID, um, we had a green team. So I assume post-COVID when, because uh, you had indicated that there's no staff that are dealing with uh, the environmental initiatives in the report. But just talk to me about the green team. So when COVID ends and people return back to work, what's your green team going to do? Yeah, Your Worship, so the Green Team has not disbanded. Uh, I'm actually one of the co-chairs on that committee. Uh, the focus right now, our terms of reference, focus on internal operations. So how can we make staff's day-to-day -day more sustainable? Uh, it doesn't necessarily look at the community as a whole. With that being said, uh, COVID really made us rethink our strategy and our priorities. I mean, the past few years, the Green Team has focused on, you know, random days where we educate staff on turning your thermometer down or not using heater in your cubicle. Uh, but now I think looking to 2021, we want to be more practical, more hands-on and have more of an influence, not only in the organization, but in the community as well. So we're not quite sure what that's going to look like yet, but I'm hopeful that we'll have a more positive influence. Thank you. And in your presentation, you also referenced, uh, City of Leduc's uh, eco station. So since council has provided funding uh, to do a major overhaul, what improvements do we see that could potentially be coming for new uh, opportunities of recycling things such as styrofoam or anything? Yeah, so we are just in the process of approving a final concept plan right now. And although it hasn't been finalized, I can say that there is ample space for more pilot projects. Uh, we have already lined up a styrofoam recycler to come in in the fall once there is room and the capacity to have them on site. Uh, so styrofoam recycling for sure will happen when the site is done. Uh, and then Again, there's other opportunities. We'll have more space. We'll have more security to allow other um, recycling initiatives. So I know Souls for Souls is a shoe recycling uh, initiative that happens in Sherwood Park. They have reached out to us to have a bin on site. Right now, it's not feasible just because of the contamination levels we're seeing and just the way the site's set up. We can't really monitor what goes into that bin. We don't necessarily want to send them garbage, but we will also hopefully have a bin on site for shoe recycling in the fall as well. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lennox. Thanks for the presentation, Sadie. Um, I do have to ask um, a question because uh, I think it's important to at least have the conversation, you know, environmental sustainability for whatever reason is not um, part of our strategic plan. Um, and so I just kind of curious, I guess, as to what kind of time, effort and and funding is kind of going into initiatives that this council, again, for whatever reason, um, did not identify those as priorities. Through your worship, I will say I was very pleasantly surprised at the list of initiatives the city is currently doing and i attribute most of them to some very passionate employees that we have in the parks department so a lot of municipalities have an environmental coordinator or have an environmental manager position that centralizes or focuses their resources on implementing initiatives like this whereas we have these incredible staff members who take it, find the resources within their existing budgets, and they make it work. Uh, this, like even collecting rainwater from our mechanic shop, that is something that an environmental person might do at another municipality. The only difference between Fort Saskatchewan and that other municipality is they have a designated person again to advertise these successes to the community. Whereas our successes are a little quieter because we don't have a person whose responsibility whose responsibility it is to celebrate them. So I think that is the biggest difference. We are checking off a lot of the boxes that other communities are. Uh, we just aren't producing a nice fancy report at the end of the year and promoting it. 
Okay, and I, I appreciate that. And I do think that there's, um, it, it's not that it, it's not important. And I know that there's obviously staff that feel the same way. Um, and I do think that it's something that hopefully the next council will revisit its priorities. Um, so I do, thank you, I appreciate the answer. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Thanks for your presentation, Sadie. Um, I don't really have any questions on your report. Um, I do think that it is uh, a cause for celebration what the city of Fort Saskatchewan does without that designated person. Um, I'm very impressed reading through this report and um, not just impressed, but proud of our city staff and our departments for doing these things without it being necessarily what was listed as a priority. Um, I mean, that just speaks to the priority uh, coming from individual people and individual departments who feel it is important to do. So um, yeah, I just have a lot of respect for that. And um, I look forward to discussing this report further um, at a strategic planning meeting or um, on the next council, uh, should you be so lucky to be on it? Um, because I think that these are things that should be on our priority list. And um, yeah, I just think it's really great. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Katie, great report. I was very much encouraged with the amount of effort that the city is putting into all of the things you mentioned. I personally have always thought of Fort Saskatchewan as a green community. Uh, I've observed the urban forests, the, the pathways, all I mean, tons of things throughout the community over the decades I've lived here. Um, personally, though, I, I always, I must admit, I always get discouraged when I hear discussion about electric vehicles in our climate. Have you seen, could you provide counsel, and I don't want you to spend a lot of time on this, so if it's not readily available, please ignore the request, but I've not ever seen any authoritative study that talks about the full environmental cost of an electric vehicle. That goes from mining the rare materials that goes into the batteries, to generating the electricity, to actually disposing of the batteries and the environmental cost at the end of the life cycle. If you have something readily available in that, I'd appreciate looking at it. And, and I, I stress, don't spend much time on this. Um, it would help me get more enthusiastic about putting some charging stations in Fort Saskatchewan as a counselor, for instance. Uh, now, this one minor quibble with your report, um, under the heading of transportation, there's a bullet point that concludes with words, and I'll read them, and therefore, so this is our local and commuter transit systems provide an alternative, and that sentence concludes with, and therefore contribute to emission reduction. Would it be possible for administration to share the calculations and the data that they have at their disposal that led administration to make that, that uh, positive comment? Through your worship, I do believe I did touch base with the transit supervisor on that, and he did have statistics from 2018, uh, but nothing since. So I'll reach out to him for some updated stats. I do believe there are, as you probably know, a lot of assumptions in that, assuming that if transit didn't exist, these individuals would drive, et cetera. Um, but I'm sure we can get something. Yep. Because I, I, it's great to make make statements that are that are factually based i think that's our job so i'd like to make sure that that one is and i'd really like to see the research and the, and the calculations behind it so if you could provide that to council please i for sure would appreciate it in other words other to conclude sadie great report appreciated reading it and um, i look forward to perhaps the next council as councillor lennox indicated addressing the concerns a little more concretely in their in their priorities list Thanks again. You bet. Okay. Thank you. And we come to Councillor Abatoye. And yes, she put this original motion on to have this brought. So go ahead, Councillor Abatoye. Yeah, I'm having difficulties on meeting. Um, so first of all, I have no questions. Um, so 
this um, environmental sustainability really wasn't a priority for this council. And that's um, what, one of the reasons why I put forward this motion to just take stock of what we were currently doing. But was I impressed by the reports? There's just so many. So like, I didn't expect the amount of things that was in the, in the report. So very good job to administration for all that you're doing. And why wouldn't we advertise and celebrate what we're doing? We have this in this report. We, we, we can find opportunities to just let people know what we're doing in this community. community. That would be amazing. And I also support, I support what she said about, um, you know, just you know, going full throttle on the waste management side, you know, and, you know, doing the multi, multi, um, multi-level um, buildings and all of that. Um, and I also agree with what Councillor Spelling said about um, getting the charging station, if that's something that's feasible and it is a grant for it, why not? Um, but other than that, I just want to say well done, kudos with this report, very impressive and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to look for a show of hands if anybody has a second round request. I have one question, but I'm going to address it to uh, City Manager Fleming as opposed to you, Sadie. Um, Mr. Fleming, if you can come on. So the question that I have is, as we all talk about the electronic vehicles, we know the new um, buzzword out there is the hydrogen, hydrogen and hydrogen uh, um, fuel stations and vehicles and everything. So is electricity going to go by the wayside in lieu of hydrogen or are we going to, you know, I, I know you've been on one of the task forces that's been talking about this, but it just feels like to me we're going down a different road. So can you just talk to us about where it's going? And, and through your worship, to be honest with you, um, Ms. Miller might have actually a better handle on that than I do. My my very high level understanding is that trans, uh, hydrogen is often noted as a what's referred to as a transition fuel, um, where it could potentially be implemented um, as as electricity and electric vehicles uh, become more mainstream. But in terms of which one might come first, or is it better to to sort of put all your eggs in one basket versus the other? Um, I really don't know that. I, I do think you make a good point, though, that before we make an investment in one or the other, we really need to look into that. Because if we if we went and bought an electric charging station and then hydrogen fuel cells seem to become the um, the way to go, we you know we would we could end up regretting that investment. And it, same thing is if we if we go all in on hydrogen, um, but electric cells seem to seem to emerge faster than than was thought. Um, we could make a mistake. So I, I agree with you that that needs to be given thought. I just, I don't know the answer um, with the level of knowledge that I have on a very complex topic. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate that because I know you were um, on the, I think this city manager's task force for the hydrogen project or something. And I know it's really being pushed out there. So I thought it would be important to have your input on that. So thank you. All right, then, so uh, I'll just ask, does anybody need a break before we go on to asset management? If not, thank you very Oh, you do? Okay, thank you very much, Sadie, for your presentation. Uh, we're at 5.53, so let's take seven, seven minutes. Can we do seven? We'll be back at six o'clock. Okay, thank you. We'll take a recess.
Okay, if everybody would like to uh, start rejoining us on your uh, video, that would be appreciated. It appears we have everybody, so we will resume the Committee of the Whole meeting. And our next item for discussion um, uh, and information is the asset management. So we welcome Clayton Northey. So thank you, uh, Clayton. You can go ahead. Uh, thank you and good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. Um, I, again, I'm Clayton Northey, the Manager of Accounting and Reporting for the City. And tonight I'm here again at council, uh, the committee to discuss um, a proposed asset management policy. Um, and before I get into the policy itself, I do want to take a step back um, into the history of where we've come from uh, in the policy, it, it, getting to this point with asset management within the city. Uh, and when I say take a, a step back, uh, I don't mean back to um, 2009 or uh, previously with previous work that's been done, but to the, uh, the current initiative. Um, the current initiative that we're working on, that we've been working on with asset management has its foundations in um, a study by Hempson Consulting in 2016, um, the long -term on long-term financial sustainability. Um, in that study, um, among other things, uh, one of the recommendations in there was that the city adopt a condition-based asset management system. The Hempson study is pretty foundational for a lot of the work that's been done over the last several years from finance perspective, um, be, including the, I think, work on things like the reserve policy um, and uh, uh, the debt management policy that's come through. Um, Condition-based asset management uh, is now really the last recommendation for the city to act on um, and to move forward on. Uh, we started working on the two thousand on this project in two thousand eighteen after the um, the council adopted the current strategic plan, uh, and uh, part of the initial assessment of that. Um, was that we realized very quickly that we needed first before we can move forward was to do a, a review of what we're currently doing, what our current systems, how they integrate with, and how they integrate with each other, and what our current practices are. Um, in 2019, uh, following a RFP process, we had selected Pillar Systems to conduct that uh, asset management review, um, and as a result of that, uh, we received a number of things. The overall, the city was uh, pillar determined that we were in a developing state of asset management where some business units like, um, and we hold out this often, roads um, are relatively mature. Um, they rely on third party independent uh, data to map out their roads maintenance and management policy or practices um, to monitor their budgets and they make appropriate change, um, do appropriate treatments. Uh, based on recommendations and best practices. Um, however, other areas within the city are less developed in that. And that, a lot of that has to do with, we, do, we don't necessarily have the ability to, in some cases, or we don't have an easy ability to uh, do um, inspections and to monitor the actual condition of the assets um, to make those determinations the same way as uh, you can with roads. Um, the review provided uh, a strategy for us to follow um, to move, to develop an integrated corporate asset management program um, that leverages our existing strengths and applies apply those to other areas and to spread out. Um, the, fo the focus of that strategy 
is to fill in the gaps, the data gaps that we have um, from, as well as to, um, that we need to do effective asset management, but also um, to unify and reconcile existing um, inventories, uh, various inventories and various systems of, on our assets so that we can use information from all of those systems into one and uh, to map out a, um, the best use of assets. Um, all, also included in that review was a proposed asset management policy that was designed specifically to support that strategy. Um, and it addressed some very critical areas like having a unified inventory system, like having um, some requirements around um, implementing best practices on um, on uh, monitoring and maintaining assets. Um, and it, in some ways, a little bit technical. Um, at the October 20th Committee of the Whole, um, a number of the comments that were that we received from count from the committee um, related to um, life cycle management, um, the inventory of the assets, and whether where council would be, whether or not council will be bound by um, the policy um, and forced into making decisions. Um, in some cases, that was very much what the policy kind of uh, in the first two. That was what that policy was designed to do. Um, is to focus on those areas. And then the last, it, there wasn't, um, what we realized was um, it wasn't clear in that policy what council's role in asset management was. Um, with overall, uh, well, all of those, uh, well, life cycle management and inventory of assets are necessary aspects of asset management. They're not the big picture. They're not the, in, the, the in, or nor are they the intent of the original recommendation from Hemson. Uh, which was to ensure long-term financial sustainability for the city. Um, nor is it um, the scope of what is considered best practice in asset management from organizations like um, NAMS Canada um, and among others. Um, so we took a second look at the policy itself and determined that it was too narrowly focused uh, and too administrative in nature. Um, therefore, we have redrafted the policy um, with, and you'll see, as you'll see in Appendix B, um, with a, an, it's more of a higher level version. Uh, this version is based on examples from uh, AUMA, um, inform, information from NAMS Canada, which is the, the, one of the largest uh, asset management organizations in Canada, um, and is a partner of FCM, as well as AUMA and RMA in developing their um, asset management uh, recommendations um, it also is more clearly focused on uh, council's role in improving service levels and allocating resources necessary to achieve those service levels. It places a stronger link to the city's long-term financial sustainability um, to, and to a stronger, emphasizes more long-term planning versus short-term decision-making. Um, the, uh, the policy in this case also forms a corporate asset management steering committee to help coordinate asset management um, initiatives um, to ensure that the that the strategy is implemented in an organized way um, and to share best practices um, as well as to report to council um, on our progress in, in implementing the strategy. Uh, the the current policy is or that the the redrafted policy is more aspirational than the original one and will take more time and resources to implement, however. Um, we are recommending moving forward with the new policy. Um, if council or if the committee is um, in favor of that approach, um, the next step would be to bring this the redrafted policy forward for uh, a future council meeting uh, for adoption. Um, we would also need to form the steering committee, which is an, an action that separately from this process we were looking at doing anyway. Um, and the original, um, now that said, the original policy and the contents of that 
are still very valuable to us and we will be able to incorporate that into administrative policies and procedures to ensure that we are applying those practices. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. And uh, today is Committee of the Whole, so it's not just questions. You do have the opportunity to provide some feedback to Mr. Northey as well. So those are the parameters. So uh, I will start with you first, Councillor Sperling. To the presentation, Clayton. Um, just in reading through this and the attachments that you provided, this is a appears to be a pretty big project for the city. Is there no, um, of course, driven off, you've referenced the Hampson report in there. Um, is there no template for something like this out there, an example of something we can use as a guide or re, are we reinventing the wheel here? Um, through your worship to Councillor Sperling, um, a lot of the information that's contained in this report and in some of the um, other, um, and some of the initiatives that we that are undertaken, there are um, pretty well trodden ground. Um, AUMA has a, for instance, um, one of the steps with the the committee. Um, AUMA provides a template for a terms of reference for a steering committee. Um, the um, service levels uh, documentation, a lot of that is actually provided um, through FCM from NAMS Canada. Uh, for a lot of for developing asset management plans, um, individual asset management strategies, um, as well as uh, the uh, the other uh, organization, uh, the uh, Institute of Public Works and Engineering Australasia, um, which is an Australian based organization, but they are really a leader globally in uh, asset management pra best practices, and so they have some pretty solid. Uh, information that can we can leverage to implement this um this process um so is that steering committee being created or are you in the process of creating it? um we are in the process of creating it um the we, we were probably back as early as September last year. We were looking at how best to move forward with these practice with the um, with the um, the various initiatives. Um, and what we realized very quickly is that uh, in order to coordinate that, we need a broader, a larger group. Um, and so when we look back at the after presenting the policy in October, um, we looked at how can we form what's best practice, what can we do, and where are we missing, where's the missing link here? Um, so we started at that point and then incorporated that into the policy. Is there any outside resources uh, needed for this, like to go outside uh, to, the city? To form the committee, no. Um, to take the next step, um, there is the, we already have, um, through, through the 2020 capital budget, we have money to take one one of the initiatives, um, which in which is to implement an asset management database, or a, that's the the actual infrastructure that we need to set this up. So we already have that approved by council. Um, in there, there's also a, um, in that project, uh, we will also need to be developing the um, performance criteria or technical service levels. Um, beyond that, um, one of the other areas where we're lacking. Um, and maybe able to incorporate into the 2021 um, existing budget um, is the training that we probably need to do. Um, currently, training for asset management planning provided by through FCM is, I believe, about 75 or 80 percent subsidized by FCM um, and is very inexpensive. Okay. All right, I'll pass it along. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I'm um, next. Um, so let's just talk about aspirational because I know on one of the other board and committees I, uh, I, I am part of, we talk about certain aspirational uh, things that we want to achieve. So is there a minimum and then something beyond that that we would try to aspire to? So just talk to me about that or talk to us about that. 
Um, when I use the term aspirational, what I mean is that this is where the other policy focused very much on getting us um, almost at a boot. The, the, the approach that we were taking was very much um, what I call a bootstrap approach where you get along from here to, from A to B and you go from A to B to A to, to C to D to E. Um, this is taking us um, and it gets it would have gotten us the next step. Um, we would have come back in a couple of years and asked for a revised policy that would have taken us probably a lot closer to here anyway. So when I say aspirational, I mean, this takes us from, from a policy perspective and a governance perspective from, from the beginning to the end. It gets us to where we should be going to. Now, actually implementing some of these things, um, having a uh, fully fleshed out long-term financial plan um beyond what our current capital budget has um is going to take time and it's going to take money and that's a future initiative that would we would have to do in order to achieve this policy um it, are we going to have every asset um, even with the previous plan we were looking at implementing um asset management practices over a four-year time horizon under the strategy um this would still follow that path um, but there's more work involved in doing that. So there may be more resources involved in getting there um, in a, at a future point. Okay, I just wanted some clarity on what your interpretation of aspirational was. Uh, Councillor Lennox? Thanks for the presentation, Clayton. You mentioned um, that, that this was the the last thing that the city chose to work on, and I'm just kind of curious as to why, why that was. Why was asset management the last thing out of that report that the city chose to, to take on? Um, there's a, probably a number of reasons, and I might ask John Nance to help with that, uh, answering this if I don't do a good enough job. Um, the Reserve policy, for instance, the debt management policy, a number of the other initiatives were really finance focused. Um, they were things that um, could be done with a relatively small group um, as well as council um, and have fairly impactful um, results. Uh, we know a lot more about what our reserves are and why we have reserves today than we did then. Um, asset management I don't believe was in the previous uh, strategic plan, although I stand to be corrected. Um, it was in the, I know it's in the refresh that was done in 2018, which is when we started this project. Um, so I believe those are the main reasons why this was, uh, why this was uh, left to last, but it's also the biggest um, initiative that's involved because it involves um, finance would uh, involves people from public works, uh, fleet facilities and engineering, um, culture and recreation, so on and so forth. Um, if John, if you have anything to add. Thanks, Clayton. I don't have a lot more to add. Um, out of the long term financial sustainability plan, there was a financial system strategy that was also developed that kind of laid out all of the different things that um, that we wanted to do. And it's a fairly extensive list. and a lot of accomplishments that you know Clayton's touched on, but reserve policy, debt management policy, operating surplus allocation policy, user fee policy and department procedures, investment policy, property tax and assessment composition policy, uh, operating capital budgets policy, man management and financial reporting policies, um, department business plans in alignment to strategic plans. So there was a lot of things and probably from Clayton's perspective, it's probably accurate. Assess asset management was one of the larger ones. Um, and uh, ironically, the, there is another one as well that, that is the next one on the list. It was asset management and service levels were the two that um, that are kind of conclude that Hemson reported all of the actions that, that uh, were contributing to it. Simply, simply, Deanna, probably the simplest answer is just it, it was the biggest and most onerous one and saved it till the end. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, thank you both for that. Um, if I could just kind of look at the policy itself, it says in the purpose that this policy is the bridge between the city's strategic plan and its overall asset management strategy. Just wondering. Um, 
if you think that that is inclusive enough because and maybe um, just including the strategic plan but when i think of this from an outsider's view i see the asset management and i see the service level and i see the public engagement all as in a triangle and because we've incorporated um, priority based budgeting i see that kind of as in, in the middle driving those other three things around it and so i'm just wondering if it would be worthwhile to incorporate the cert i know that throughout the document that the service level policy is is referenced but I, i'm wondering if um that public engagement piece um, and even the priority based budgeting is worth mentioning just because I just see them so intertwined. And again, that's just my outside perspective. I'm interested to hear what you might have to say. Um, through your worship to Councillor Lennox, um, I'm glad that you're seeing the connection because I think in the previous version, and this is why I wanted to redraft, I don't think that connection was easily made. Um, so I think we, I, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, the service level policy that uh, John's gonna be talking about next um, is, um, I think they're very integral. Um, this does touch on um, engage, community engagement. I believe it's uh, one of the, I have to go back and look through there, um, but it says that we're going to incorporate um, for new, uh, just looking here for each uh, decisions to acquire and i'll just kind of read this out if you don't mind uh, decisions to acquire new assets will be based on the understanding that the asset supports long-term goals of the community and that the full life cycle costs of ownership shall be considered and incorporated in com into community engagement regarding customer service levels so it's when we and it kind of frame, puts a frame around that from that perspective that we do need to bring this forward when we're talking about changing service levels and when we talk um, kind of take that back a little bit further. Um, when we talk about service levels, with when we talk about building up a new pool, for instance, and this has always been the, the one uh, that comes up. When we talk about building a new pool, um, you are talking about, and, and it's, not, it's not always clear whether we're talking about changing service levels or we're, whether we're keeping up with existing capacity. Um, that needs to be part of the discussion and it does and we do recognize that it needs to be part of the discussion that when you are talking about adding a pool you're talking about changing your service levels and there are uh, there are costs to that long long-term costs and what are we trying to actually achieve and how will we know that we've achieved it um and through the long-term financial planning um you're also looking at the trade-offs with other areas um within priority based budgeting i didn't specifically mention it, um, although I think John does a better job of that in service levels, of sort of looking to, um, through this policy, and we could certainly add that. Um, we could, I was looking to rely on John through the service level policy to tie the linkage between the service level we're trying to achieve and the programs that we are using to link that, um, but it certainly could be incorporated here as well. Okay, and I just have a question just because you mentioned that that one section um, under 4.1, uh, point one, the decisions to acquire new assets. I'm just wondering why did why only new assets are in there? Um, we look at in that one, when we talk about it, and it's, it's spelled out in the definition a little bit better, um, but when we talk about that, the decision to buy new assets are to expand. Uh, to expand your capacity to um, change a service level, really. Uh, when you look at maintaining existing infrastructure, there is an area, uh, and I'd have to read through this again, but there is also an area in here that we talk about, when do we, when do we stop providing a service? Um, and that's another component, but when do we retire the assets entirely? Uh, and I don't mean, uh, when do we get rid of, get out of the business of being in a pool? Uh, of having pools, not that that's a goal, but um, and that certainly does have to be part of that discussion as well. Um, so again, that's feedback that certainly could be incorporated into this policy. Okay. I have some more questions, but I'll, I'll okay, yeah. we'll come back on round two. Okay, uh, Councillor Macon. 
Thanks for your presentation, Clayton. Um, I do have several questions. Uh, my first one is under 4.1.4, it says the utilization and function of all assets will be considered periodically together with the cost of operating and maintaining. I'm not a huge fan of the word periodically. Um, I'm just wondering if it would be better to actually indicate at what intervals we're going to review this policy. Um, through your worship to Councillor Macon, um, actually this was the the clause that I was looking for um, a moment ago um, regarding essentially end of when do we stop doing a service level and maybe the, the terminology isn't quite clear here, um, but we wouldn't, the reason we wouldn't necessarily want to put a, a specific timeline on all assets across the city, whether it's a pickup truck um, or a building or a roadway is that those time horizons that you would consider that um, are going to be different over their life of the asset. Um, you're going to, if we realize that our fleet is too large, for instance, and we decide to reduce the size of the fleet or expand the size of the fleet um, or get an electric bus or get a, an electric car um, as from leading back, um, that time horizon that we're going to make those decisions on is maybe an annual thing or maybe every three years, whereas the decision about do we need uh, a city hall or a, an expanded city hall or a new fire department, um, a new fire hall, sorry, um, is going to be on a much longer time horizon, maybe over a, a 20 or 30 or 40 year period. So it is, it's difficult to pin that to a specific timeline. Is there the potential though for some assets, um, I guess maybe to uh, miss the opportunity uh, for review um, if it's not more specific? Um, through your worship to Councillor Macon, um, point taken. Um, the goal here, it, in my uh, view, and we could change the wording on this a little bit, is anytime we're looking at a renewal or a replacement, uh, we should be questioning, is this the right asset for to achieve the, the, the stated goals of the of why we own it? Um, the do we need to replace it? Do we need to have it in the first place? So absolutely your point is well taken and I can make uh, changes for that. OK, and then um, my second question then would be um, under 4.2.2, .2, provide a forum for discussion of asset management strategies, integration, and best practices. I'm just curious, um, who do we have in the city who would we consider is our subject matter expert on asset management? Or um, Councillor Sperling had kind of pointed to outside resources. Is there, um, I guess, a point where you might feel that we need to bring somebody in who is more of an expert, or do you feel that we have that expertise? Um, through your worship to Councillor Macon, uh, at um, some point in the future, and I, I do believe that there is a, there will be a point in time where it makes a lot of sense for us to have an asset management coordinator or manager. Many municipalities do have that. Um, at this point, we're not asking for that, but it's certainly on the radar. It's certainly something that we want to look at um down the road okay i appreciate it and i have more questions um Erica. yeah we will uh do a round to councillor kelly yes thank you uh, clayton good evening and thank you for the report my initial comment i very much appreciate your second draft over your first draft it touches on several things that are were important to me uh you did let me stop there for a second yeah. put this in perspective for those that are viewing what is your estimate and I know it's off the cuff but what is your off the cuff estimate of replacement value for assets and property owned by the city of Fort Saskatchewan um, through your worship to Councillor Kelly um, I would be very cautious, as any accountant would be, um, in trying to make an estimate off the cuff like that. Um, our current total asset cost, historical cost asset base, is about uh, in excess of $600 million. Um, some of those assets are more than 50 years old. 
Um, so you have a significant amount of inflation since then, and we wouldn't necessarily do that um, quite easily. It could be in the one to two billion dollar range. Thank you. As part of the research for the first round on this, I happened upon an asset review undertaken by a community in Ontario 20 years ago. I think on the province of Ontario is much further ahead than the province of Alberta on this, in part because the province of Ontario back then funded municipalities to get work done in this area. And for some reason, it was ignored in the province of Alberta. But that smaller community, a much smaller community 20 years ago, came up with an asset value of 300 plus million. <coughs> I do, I'm an accountant, Clayton. Um, I'm not in your shoes, so I'll hazard a guess, and I'm gonna suggest rather strongly that it's in excess of $2 billion. Uh, and, and whether it's a billion five or two is neither here nor there. <coughs> Excuse me. The point is, that is a ton of money. It's a huge investment and replacement is a huge investment. So having an organized approach to how we handle our assets from essentially birth to death, the full life cycle, how they impact service levels and how service levels impact our assets is fundamental really in my mind to how we do business. I think we're behind on it and that's no aspersions toward administration or past councils. It seems to be the nature of the beast in Alberta. But I do believe we're rather far behind on the program and I encourage whatever steps we could take to get at it. Um, I'll make one more comment and then I'll wait my turn again. You referenced FCM and AUMA. I agree with you, Clayton. They have a ton of information available even at a, at a information at available that I could easily understand. One of the things I thought was notable in, in one of their uh, pieces of information is they referred to level of service. And, and there was a distinction made between council's level of service and administration's level of service that I think would be worth paying attention to. They refer to uh, Customer level of service is the phrase, and that's the level of service from the perspective of the person using the service, and that's what council sets. Council represents the taxpayer. Council sets a customer level of service. Technical level of service are the operational measures for staff that support achieving the customer level of service, and that's, that's the role of administration. It might make sense, Clayton, to, to insert those phrases into the policy just so that it's clear to future councils as well what, what level of service means for the two types, two roles we, we deal with on every meeting we have. And Murkatcher, please come back to me. Okay. Oh, through your worship, just to um, respond to Councillor Kelly, if you don't mind, um, that those definitions are actually included in under 3.6 of the policy. Um, as well as under the service level policy um, that uh, Mr. Dance will be presenting later. Clayton, thank you. I stand corrected. I uh, I absolutely missed that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Nodi. Um, so just as a follow up to um, um, Councillor Kelly's question or comment, um, so yes, the definition of customer service um, the definition of customer service level and technical service level is actually there, but it actually confused me because for me, it's serv um, service level is it relates to what quality, quantity, quantity, cost, and reliability, right? And so seeing these two separate definitions really confused me. And I was, I was going to ask that, why do we even have to separate the, the definition? But hearing what he said actually just made me made me understand better. So I would agree with the comments he said. Yes, the definition is there, but clearly stating that um, this um, customer service is what council council's um, council's um, service of level is and technical is for administration. I think it will it will uh, it will define it better for a layman. And like I didn't understand it when I saw that, and that was going to be my first question. So I guess my question has been answered. 
Um, so, but just to, um, um, so on the redraft, I definitely appre um, appreciate this redraft compared to the older one, um, because it clearly defines the different roles and responsibilities for different people. And um, I think it's it's better than the last one. So I, I, um, I support some, I support making this part the policy. Um, so another question I had was, I, I guess you already answered the question um, through Councillor Lennox. I was going to ask, uh, how does PVB tie into all of this? Because I do see the priority-based budgeting, um, you know, in all of this, you know. And so you already answered that question. So that's um, that's good. Um, and just one uh, one more question I had, I've also been ans answered, is because you had mentioned that there's going to be future resources required. Um, and so what I hear is that we might have to um, approve a uh, future FTE for this to take up because this is a huge, enormous job that's, one person can do from this off of the side of their desk, right? It has to be a um, um, dedicated person. Yeah, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, I think you asked and answered your own question, so I think we're good. That. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Yes. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Councillor Harris. You know, it's interesting. This journey started about 17 years ago when I worked for the city, and it's interesting to see that there has been fits and starts of success in terms of how this uh, asset management has, has gone on. And as Clayton touched on earlier, Public Works and all the hard services have been doing asset management for years. And it's well defined and it's well understood. It's when you move into the softer elements of asset management that uh, is, is more problematic. Um, I worked with a number of people whose uh, professional um, service offerings was entirely asset management, and they've worked for huge organizations. Uh, even even the city of Edmonton, for example, is not where they should be with asset management. Uh, city of Calgary is not where they should be. They're billion dollar organizations, and they are not where they should be. They're good in certain areas, but they're lacking in many others. And it's patently obvious, and I think Clayton, you would probably know that from your journey in relation to what you've been doing with John. Um, but I'm glad to see that you've redrafted the, the policy because I think it's, it's important to draw that distinction because technical and administrative asset management is the stuff where the rubber hits the ground and uh, you know it, it gets done. And it feeds into a process that we've been talking about through the PBB and through the asset management registers the, the, you know, the whole issue of the reporting for financial purposes. And I'm glad to see it coming together. But I have one question. Clayton and John, if you're listening, when are you going to have this wrestled to the ground so that we can say we are not the city of Edmonton, we are not the city of Calgary, we are not the city of Toronto, we are the city of Fort Saskatchewan, and we do this right? And it's an evolving process. When's that? When, give me a timeline. When are we going to have this wrestled to the ground? because the city's been talking about it for 17 plus years. And I, either Clayton or John, whoever. Oh, through your worship, um, if we follow the, if we continue to follow the policy, the strategy that um, Pillar Systems provided for us um, to take, um, and this focuses, it uh, very much focuses on a couple of very important areas of uh, asset management, but it's not the whole thing. If we move forward with that pro, project or continue to move forward with that project um, it's probably I think I mentioned before a three to four year journey um, on top of that um, there is other pieces we do that we need to bring into bring to bear um, those things can happen on the side of that uh, and I think they naturally will happen on the side of that but I think realistically you're looking at three to four years to get us from here to what um, I would say uh, FCM's F FCM has a readiness scale that I comp I always compare to um, a, a, a five point scale. Um, today, most of the city is at a one or two. Uh, in four years, if we continue following this down this path, we should be at about a four. Um, there is a that five level that level five is well beyond. We would have to make a decision at that point whether we want to push for that. But the, the, that level five. Um, uh, uh, asset management process that they get to really gets into a point where we'd have to decide whether the cost of getting there is worth it for our community. 
I, I think that is a very, very uh, astute observation, Clayton, because you have to look at the investment for the outcome return. And uh, I, I think getting to that three and a half, four max is probably about the the best we can strive for in a cost-effective manner. So I'm just glad and I, I acknowledge the work that you guys have been doing. And to see it tied together with all the other policies that are coming forward, I think is really indicative of a mature administration for our community. And as the next council comes in uh, into office at, in the next term, I'm glad to see that you're moving forward. And I think that'll be a good opportunity for the next council to put those things into a strategic perspective that is rightly balanced. And where the balance is, I think, is going to be important. That's why I asked the question. So thanks for that answer. Appreciate it. Okay, hey, thank you. So we're going to go on to round two. So if we can narrow the focus a little bit to provide Clayton any additional feedback that he may need if there's changes that uh, we see would would be required on this bylaw or questions that would really be appreciated. Okay, not holding everybody's feet to the fire, but uh, he's really needing feedback at this point in time if it's going to come back. Okay, uh, Councillor Sperling, anything further? No further comments. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. Councillor Lennox. I do. Uh, Clayton, in section one point, or sorry, four point one point three, says a long-term financial plan will be maintained, which considers the renewal and replacement of existing assets. I'm just wondering why it doesn't have renewal, replacement, and removal as an option. Um, again, this is probably following your previous point. Um, it's certainly something we can uh, I can make a change to. Okay. And just so from my reading of this policy, next steps seem to be identify the assets, identify the service level of each asset, develop maintenance strategies and long-term financial plan for each, which re includes the renewal, replacement and disposal. Is that pretty much um, the policy sets out? Uh, through your worship, that, those will be the mechanical steps that we would take. Um, there's a few from a governance perspective internally establishing the, uh, the steering committee, formally establishing a steering committee um, establishing uh, administrative procedures and things on that line as well. But the main meat of it is that, yes. Okay. And I do think, um, and I like the, the roles and responsibilities um, in 4.2D to have this come back annually, because I do think that that is a mechanism um, that this council and the next can utilize to make sure that this does stay at the forefront and so it doesn't get lost. So I do appreciate that section as well. Thanks, Clayton. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon. Okay, so I have a couple more things. So under 4.2.3b, uh, develop and implement of asset management plans. Um, I'm just curious who approves the asset management plan. So after they do that development work, does somebody actually take a look at it before it gets implemented or that area they can develop, implement, approve on their own? Um, typically, um, and different organizations do it um, differently. Um, typically what I would expect to see here would be um, that the steering committee would do approvals and it depends on, again, it depends on the asset itself. It may in some cases be directors, uh, but it may be the steering committee looking at it uh, to review over, overall. Um, some organizations have council review and approve um, asset management plans. And in some cases with some asset assets um, that may be of value, but in almost all cases, that would be verging, coming outside of, uh, that would be very much an administrative task to approve the AMPs. Okay, so I'll just, I guess, leave that with you to ponder if uh, that wording needs to be in on the approval. And then uh, my other question is that uh, when I was reviewing the service level policy, I came across uh, that it would, that some would require asset performance assessments. So it lead me to jump back to this policy just to take a look at that. And under uh, the same heading, um, number two was 
identify both current and desired customer and technical service levels and asset performance assessment criteria. So we have this group developing the criteria, but again, I'm gonna ask who, who does the actual asset performance assessment? And is that some language that is missing in this or is it embedded somewhere that I'm missing? I, I believe that sort of through your worship to Councillor Macon, um, I believe that that um, is something that we would probably flesh out a little bit more in administrative procedure. Um, the but typically, um, depending again, depending on the asset, if it's uh, those assessments could be anywhere from the driver who takes the uh, truck out uh, before they take the truck out, they do a, a condition assessment. Um, just like you would at a rental vehicle, uh, they already do that. So it's just taking that information and putting it into a system. Um, other areas, uh, it may be something like the PMQ, or sorry, Pavement Quality Index, PQI, uh, for roads. Um, that's done by a third party independent. Uh, or a combination of. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate all your answers. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Lennox has lost her audio for a little while, so she still is with us. Uh, just she doesn't have any audio right now, or not audio, um, uh, video, sorry. Uh, but she is still with us. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're next. Yes, thank you. And uh, back to where I left off last time, you're absolutely right, Councillor Abitoy. That's what I was driving at the distinction between the roles of council and, and administration that I think was missing in the definitions. Um, to move forward, Clayton, the definition of risk 3.12, I'd like to suggest that that, that definition be expanded. It's, it, it, the real risk isn't the risk of the failure in my mind, it's the amount of damage done by the failure or that result from the failure. So, so a ballpoint pen that fails on a weekly basis costs the city nothing. If we lost the sewer system to half the city for six months, the, the, the consequences are catastrophic. And that's the risk we have. I think we should be identifying in our, in our asset management program. With those comments in mind, I think it would make sense, and I'd encourage you to, to, to give it some consideration, to separate and distinguish between core assets, in other words, assets fundamental to the operation of the city and non-core, uh, because I think the risk is different for the two, primarily. Um, again, core assets are things that we have to have in order to function as a city and to lose one of them could be catastrophic. The non-core, um, I'm a little less, the risk is a little lower simply because I think that the consequences are smaller. And I think that covers it. Um, yeah, I've got further comments, but they tie more directly to the service level review coming up. So thanks again, Clayton. Okay, thank you. Uh, you. Councillor Abatoye, written anything further? Um, just um, to, um, to um, speak further on what Council Kelly just said. So I think the word you you, you might be missing is the severity of the um, of the incidents. Um, but to um, back to my question. Um, so if, for example, I'm just looking at um, a situation where maybe like uh, we have like a road condition where we don't have enough money to to bring it up to par to where it should be. Like so, I'm talking about speaking about um, current gaps in our assets, right? Um, how 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 would we um, through the the policy? How would we how would we be able to close current gaps in our assets? And who would be responsible for that? Would that be under the long term financial plan? And um, also consequences, long-term consequences, what would those be handled? Um, through your worship to Councillor Abatoya, um, the role, if there's gap, if there are gaps in existing funding, um, what the asset, what asset management planning does generally, um, 
uh, is it tells you how much money you would need to additionally to invest to bring it up to par. Um, and through the budgets, presumably, um, we would um, recommend, the administration would recommend that we do bring that up, uh, bring that funding up um, to fund those. Um, this would, so it would certainly give um, information about prioritization. It would enhance the, um, the prioritization that we're already doing with PPP uh, for that purpose. Um, but, and it would tell you what most, most asset management systems are most, uh, are, um, will provide an optimized um, strategy for getting there. Um, they won't just say, okay, this is where you need to be. They say, okay, this is where you need, but this is what this, this is how you smooth out the tax impact of that. Um, and then through the long-term financial planning, through budgets, um, we can achieve that. Uh, we, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so just one more thing. So if there were like regulatory or legislative requirements that we're supposed to do through our asset management, would that be, um, would that, should that come up in the policy? Um, through your, through your worship, uh, Councillor Abatoya, um, a, a typical asset management um, plan document actually includes um, regulatory and legislative requirements. It also includes things like um, identification of critical infrastructure and things down that line. Uh, when there's changes, um, you would need to make changes to the asset management that are that affect the asset or impact the asset. Um, they will need to be uh, recognized here. Um, there's other impacts to that as well. Um, for instance, in some cases, if there's changes to environmental legislation, um, under new accounting standards that we have to adopt in a couple of years, we're going to have to uh, recognize the cost of those uh, that increased li environmental liabilities, uh, for example. Um, and that's all going to incor be incorporated into this as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Harris, anything further? I got to tell you, I have never seen a council, and I've dealt with lots of councils that have been so concerned about asset management. So kudos to all of you guys. You're asking great questions. I think we're moving in the right direction. That's all I have to say. Okay, so you're good. Um, do we need a round three? I'll just look for show of hands. Anybody? Okay. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, information. So next steps, we will see the policy with some tweaks in it and then coming for a resolution at an open meeting soon. Through, through your worship, uh, sorry, your worship, um, we would be um, bringing this back as quickly as we can to start moving forward on it. Okay, I just want to make sure. All right, thank you very much, Clayton. Uh, oh. Uh, Councillor Macon? No, I apologize. I was just giving good night to Clayton. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so with that, we will move on. Okay. Um, just uh, being asked for a five minute break. Okay. So we're seven minutes to the hour. So take the seven minutes because that puts us right back at seven o'clock. Okay. So we re will recess till seven o'clock. Sorry, John.
everybody would like to start rejoining us, we will begin the next session. I love your curtains. Hey, we're just waiting for Councillor Sperling. There we go. So we will resume the meeting and uh, the next item is service level review. And we have Mr. Dance uh, presenting. Thank you, Mayor Catcher. I am here to present the service level policy for Committee of the Whole Feedback. The policy provides a framework and consistent approach to establish, document, review, and potentially adjust service levels. The policy is drafted to be practical, sustainable, realistic to put into practice, and, utilizing and utilize existing systems when appropriate, including uh, priority-based budgeting tools and program data. The city has documented service levels a number of ways. Fort Saskatchewan did formal work on service profiles and service levels in 2011, which can be built upon. There's also a number of more recent documents and administrative procedures, including the parks service levels that is an attachment to the package. Council would have seen those park service level documents in uh, May of 2019. So the policy standardizes the documentation processes, including the resources required. For review and possible adjustment, timing, timing is expected to primarily occur in the budget process or as required if emergent. Council saw examples in the 2021 budget, both within budget requests as well as the priority based budgeting program reports and specifically any service level changes. So a few examples just to, to bring back in terms of some of the service level uh, decreases that were actually contemplated in the 2021 budget were around the DCC child mining, uh, the DCC hours and um, stat holidays, utilities recycling and blue bag initiatives, the transit local and commuter. And then there was also a service level increase that was within IT security and data management. So those were shown both within, typically within program um, reports as well as within budget requests. For establishing or adjusting existing service levels, the policy sets out key factors, including comparators, community input, statistics and data, cost savings, population served, reliance, demand status, and priority alignment to council's results and uh, strategic plans. Again, a lot of those data and tools are available in priority-based budgeting. The policy strives to achieve a balance reflecting the spectrum of programs and their service levels and the practicality for a realistic process for documenting and reviewing service levels. City-wide, we have approximately 200 programs, just under 200 programs that range from solid waste collection to accounts payable to sheep grazing. So next steps, so following Committee of the Whole and the feedback that is received tonight, uh, we would, with this particular policy, it would be the same timeline that Clayton alluded to for asset management. We'd wanna to return to council as soon as possible in, likely in February for, for formal approval of a policy document. With policy approval, departments would undertake the work to document service levels based on the policy framework. And then in the 2022 budget process, you would see the, the documentation and continued use of the priority-based budgeting tools to, to highlight any possible service changes. So with that, the presentation is done and 
appreciate any feedback on the policy. Okay, thank you. And I am first on the speaking order this time. Uh, so well, I thought it was actually pretty good. I quite enjoyed what uh, what you included in this. Um, the question that I had is really how does this then tie to the priority based budgeting? Because uh, one thing you have priority based budgeting that says you're going to do this and this, but under the guiding principles and key factors, it really talks about the city residents and businesses and community input. So. How does that tie to that? Because that could really give it a different weighting. I think uh, to, to no catcher. I think there's you've got different uh, different factors to consider. Where where the policy contemplates using um, priority based budgeting is just to um, obviously it, it starts with the program. So our programs and costing is a huge part of of the piece of of service levels and the cost of service is is a piece of that. The ability to consider some of the tools that, that are within priority-based budgeting in terms of where it aligns to the different priority results that council has established and, and some of those attributes. I think other pieces of, of the puzzle are those things like public engagement and service requests and, and trends and future needs. So it's, it's not one exclusively, it's a combination of factors that would be considered in terms of adjustments or recommendations or adjustments from administration to council through the budget processes. Okay, and then my uh, second question ties to the, the um, information that you put in here. So like parks program one, cemetery operation. So it talks about the inventory volume and demand. Um, I, I guess I kind of look at that and, and from from this step, that's the service level. But do we ever get into, um, for example, the cemetery is almost full or something? You know, hypothetically, uh, is there ever sort of a, a line item saying, you know, you need to look at something? Or I guess that ties back to the asset management. That's where they cross. Yeah, yeah, I would see them crossing there or in other. I know the the cemetery in particular has looked at a, a long term. I'm not sure accommodation plan is the right word, but in terms of the growth and, and when it needs to, uh, you know, when it's full and when it needs to be expanded or look in different mechanisms for um, for cemetery services. Okay. Okay. I think that's probably good. The only observation I made on the parks one, um, they talk about cremation 288 niches. Um, it's sort of like high density uh, accommodation. They have it all plugged into one area. They could spread it out amongst the rest of them. <laughs> Just a comment. Um, okay, Councillor Lennox on the uh, policy, uh, uh, service level policy. Thanks, um, and thanks, John. I, I do think that it's um, it's gotta be a huge undertaking for one thing um, to kind of get into every little nook and cranny, but I do think that it's a necessary process. I just wondering, I know that um, that we've talked about how everything is kind of being linked together and like between the asset management, the service level and the community engagement. Do you see value, I guess, in linking them in within the documents? Like I know that what you have here um, mentions priority based budgeting um, and asset management, but also just wondering if the public engagement policy is also something that needs to be directly referred to and referenced within this policy. Uh, yeah, I think it, it is definitely and and it, you did mention this earlier, Councillor Lennox, and I think you the fact that we are connecting all of these is 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 hugely important and you know all of these pieces of of data help support decisions and um as we look at asset management and service levels and tenure capital plans and public engagement and um, user fees policies all of these pieces of uh of the puzzle in some ways are, are there to help support decisions um but public engagement definitely it's it is um it's in it's inferred in a couple places in here but i think um you know it, it definitely could get highlighted more thanks for that feedback and i'm just wondering um because i did read some of the 
the uh, FCM and the AMA. I think there is an ma asset management course document. Um, and it said an example of how council decisions can impact levels of service. And it said adopting vision statements that set higher misaligned expectations for service levels without considering implementation realities. Just wondering if you what your thoughts are on that. And and I think back to the uh, MDP and having that be a visionary document. And we did have some discussion about, you know, whether or not those were realistic visions for our community. So just wondering if you can provide any comments or feedback on that. Um, it's a bit of a balance, um, you know, having aspirational goals and where the vision is. I think, you know, if we do look at specifically at our vision, I think um, our vision is within the strategic plan is, is, is aspirational and realistic. Um, I do think this piece of service levels uh, is a critical piece to, to that, that, um, that concern that you, that, that is expressed in AUMA documents. By, by being able to articulate um, where we're at, it gives that ability to, to make decisions based on, based on those levels and whether that level is right, whether it's wrong, um, whether it needs to be adjusted, um, whether it needs to be adjusted for other reasons outside, uh, you know, financial reasons potentially. So uh, it, it's, it's the grounding piece. For me, the service levels is the grounding piece that, that helps with, with, that, with that question that you've, that you've raised. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Um, and I do, for me, this whole discussion about all these pieces are, has really been about fostering good decision making. So, and I think that that is vital to, to uh, municipal governance. So thanks for the work that you've done. Great, thank you, Councillor Macon. Thanks for your presentation, John. Uh, my question was actually around the pipeline already based budgeting and the key factors so you've already answered it so thank you very much yep, thank you uh councillor kelly yes thank you and thank you john for your effort on this particular subject um starting from scratch is never an easy easy project uh what drove me to to, to discuss a service level policy at the outset was a desire to see at least new programs have documentation that includes the, the things that you reference in section seven of, of, of your report. Uh, I think the only thing that's missing in section seven is reference to a review process when and how that will be set, what factors would be taken into account. I would suggest that a review process would be set for all services, but, but of course, independently of each other because not, a, not any two are the same. And I do think it makes sense in this report, just like the capital asset policy, to make a distinction between core services and non-core services. Um, core services we must perform. We cannot stop sending out property tax bills. We cannot stop issuing utility bills and we cannot stop plowing the roads. We can only hope in those situations to be perhaps more efficient and or, and or respond to, 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 to um, different customer needs or, or uh, perceptions as they evolve. So the review process allows us to do that. And then the other thing that I think is perhaps missing in section seven is a reference committing the departments to collect the necessary data to do the reviews when they are scheduled. And, and I don't know what that data would be. Again, it would be different for every flipping service that we provide and would be established as the documentation for each of those services is, is, um, is drafted. So 
I guess a question of you, is it your thought then that going forward over the next period of time that the service level documentation will be prepared for each of the services that the city performs? That is the intent, yes. And, and just to be clear, a lot of it is, not a lot of it, some of it is already done. It's just in different mechanisms or it's partially done and needs to be built upon. Okay, um, Mayor Catcher, if I may, one more comment. Back to the AM, my comment on the asset management policy. The AMA has a pretty good description. Again, you touch on it, but a good description of the differing roles of council and, and administration. And I would submit respectfully that the two service level documents that they provided have a level of detail that makes them technical and, and in the realm and bailiwick of administration rather than council. I'm not at all convinced that council needs to talk about the height of grass in the ditch. I prefer not to actually. I'd like to, to talk about the concept and the budget to do the ditches and we work it out from there. So back to the role of, that gets me back to the role of council and administration and, and a description so that it's clear for future councils. Um, that's good for now, Mayor Catcher, please come back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Abatoye. Um, no questions, just, um, just back to the definitions of the customer service level and the technical service level um, was identified in the previous um, presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harris. No, I don't have any questions, but I think anytime you try to define services as uh, Councillor Kelly, talked about, you, you kind of get into an interesting discussion. Um, what's core, what's not core, what's legislated, what's not. Um, uh, even even in a legislated or a regulated uh, requirement, you can deliver the service any number of ways, which then would it would Im impact uh, the cost of the of the delivery of that service. Um, so I think I think trying to document this thing is is um, is a challenge. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, we've started down the road. So that's good. Uh, other than that, those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, John. I don't have a whole lot. Just uh, just around the priority based budgeting model again and. Uh, would we run all of our services through our priority-based model? Uh, through your worship, we do. We do. All okay, so, yeah, so, so if you do that and you get a bunch of fours, what do you do with the fours? Um, it's just one piece of the data. So quartile four program is, is a program that typically is less aligned with the, the priorities that, um, that the city has established and, and the attributes. Um, so if, as an example, it's just a piece of the data that, um, you know, if, if, if you were considering making changes or reallocating, it would probably be one that you would consider as one factor to reconsider for allocations. Reallocation. Okay, and that's, that was my point. It was around the money and the budget, and is it potential then that we'd find some better use for dollars in a program that uh, we, we'd consider to be a very low priority? So that's the only question I had. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll go on to round two. I don't have any more questions. Councillor Lennox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Macon. You're good. Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Uh, John, under purpose, I'd like to suggest for council consideration and yours as well, obviously, that the real purpose of a service level policy is to provide for fair and equitable distribution of city resources that considers both the user and non-user groups. Um, the purpose, your purpose as, as written, really is simply, and I don't mean to, 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 to be sound negative, but describes no, it. Uh, just sorry, Councillor Sperling, could you mute please? Oh, sorry. sorry, I've got paper noise in my ear. Sorry about that. Do you need me to repeat? Did you catch what I said? 
Just that last line. Okay. Um, the fair and equitable distribution of resources, I think, is the purpose, not a description of what a service level is. So I think the purpose of the of the policy is is rather holistic. That that we're 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 trying to accomplish something, not describe what we're doing. I'd like you to consider that, please. Um, there has been mention multiple times tonight about how this all ties together, and I couldn't agree more. Asset management service levels absolutely feed off of each other and feed each other. Uh, Part of it is, is the, and the whole reason we do any of this, it's to serve our customers. And not that I'm suggesting that the city should subscribe to ISO 9001 principles, but, but ISO 9001 is, is rather interesting because the whole focus of that, of that program is customer oriented business. I'm sure it's, rather overwhelming to try to consider it in a, in a, in a municipal level, but it, it, it's a heck of a guide. And it talks about the organizational wide focus on customer service and, the, and the, the need and policies around continuous improvement. So continuous improvement is we decide what we're gonna do, we do it, we monitor it and we review it and we make changes as we determine necessary and we go at it again and then we review it at a later date. So continuous improvement. And if you could build something into the policy that touches upon that, I think it would be well worthwhile. Uh, the public engagement part is, is again something this council's talked about many times. I took the time to look at uh, Gov006C public engagement policy for the city of Fort Saskatchewan. It was drafted in 2012 with a review date of 2015, but I don't think it's been touched upon. Uh, I'm not suggesting we're going to do this in the next month or two, but Gov006 public engagement policy needs a serious rework. It, it, it spends its time talking about a, a consultant's report and simply references a consultant's report as a policy, and I'm not at all certain that that applies in this day and age, John, and, and I'd encourage administration to take a look at that. Um, and that could perhaps feed us into how we look at community engagement, customer engagement on a go forward basis, because I'm not at all convinced we've been paying attention to Gov006 for the past engagement we've done over the last couple of years. I think those are my, my comments. Thank you, John, again. I appreciate the effort. Maybe, uh, Mayor Catcher, I can, I can just close the loop on public engagement. So it was an issue that was brought up at budget this year, um, and there's a commitment to bring back the policy as well as the, um, the IAP2 framework, which is the consultant report, the International Association of Public Participation before Q2 of, of 2021. So the actual framework is still quite relevant from IAP2. The policy is definitely is definitely updated. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, before you sign off, will you require round three or not? Are you good? Just thank you, uh, Mayor Catcher. I'm good. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Abatoye. Anything further? You're good. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Anything further? You're good. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. You're good. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Dance. So next steps on this is you're just going to do a little bit of tweaking and then it will come. Uh, yeah, I will be back hopefully in February and maybe we can coincide it. Uh, Clayton and, and I can tag team in at a council meeting again. Okay, super. Thank you very much. All right. The next item that we have is city manager bylaw and Mr. Fleming presenting. Thank you, Your Worship. You can hear me okay? Can hear you fine. Good. Um, so I'm just gonna do a very quick uh, presentation. 
Um, I like to have slides. Unlike my general manager before me, I think I think the best items are always preceded with a few slides. You got to do it. So, um, this city manager bylaw is being coming is coming forward for council um, simply for an update. Um, there was no pressing issue that I think was um, requiring us to do it with any urgency, which is probably why it sat on my desk for about two years before I got here. But um, here we are now. City manager bylaw is a requirement of the Municipal Government Act. Um, the last one was um, passed, I think it was 1995. I'm not aware of it having an update uh, between then and now. Um, and it is an important document as I outlined in the report um, in that it does uh, do a good job of really clarifying the expectations and authorities of the CAO and, and actually that between that uh, position and council. And uh, it does help with clarity and accountability and one idea, one situation that's ideal is that you have a, um, the CAOs unfortunately tend to come and go from time to time, but it is good if you have the CAO bylaw that um, can sort of outlast uh, the CAOs and sort of provide continuity um, from from person to person um, as the as they change. We actually did pull the main comparators we use when looking at best practices were these four municipalities here. Um, we didn't take everything that we found in their bylaws. We took uh, the parts that we liked and then we kept the parts that we liked um, in the bylaw that we had in place. And really the key updates just focus on inflation um, to some of the dollar amounts that were in there. Um, we did want to add a provision for uh, the waiving of fees in certain circumstances. It doesn't happen very often, but from, to from time to time, something will go wrong with one of our services. Um, Usually it'll be with culture and recreation or something, and we just want to have the ability to to refund um, like a fee or or something that somebody pays, um, uh, so that uh, we do have that authority without having having to go to council to refund a simple fee. And then uh, from a legal perspective, especially in this day and age when we're doing so much electronically, we did want to have the ability um, uh, for me to delegate the authority for electronic signatures, so that was included as a new provision. And other than that, I'll just uh, take any questions or comments if council has them. Um, if the comments are, are minor, we'll actually try to have this back next week. Um, if it's major, then uh, we'll probably be back uh, sometime after that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Councillor Lennox, you're first. I don't have any questions, thanks, Troy. Thank you, Councillor Macon. I have no questions either, thanks, Troy. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. I have no questions, uh, Troy, and uh, I support the what I consider to be minor changes that you proposed to the bylaw, or the part, not the yeah bylaw. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. I've got just one question. Um, four point four. So we're just gonna. Let's get it. What is the place where it says that you 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 um that you I think it's a new one are you allowed to um um waive any charges or fees? And I'm wondering would that would that include property taxes at all? Property tax charges. Um, four point four zero. Um, you know what? And that's actually a good point. Maybe I'll take a second look at that one and make sure there are certain things that I don't want to have the ability to waive. Property taxes would probably be a good one. So. Um, I'll actually take a quick look at that one um, uh, before we bring it back again. That's a good okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Um, no questions and uh, no observations. Just good to update the bylaw every once in a while. 1995 is a long time ago. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling. Or just one question on 4.4M. We're looking at uh, increase from fifty to one hundred thousand for the allowable amount of a commencement or settlement. And is there is that a is that been an issue? Is there a problem with the limit of fifty thousand? Or um, through you, Your Worship, to be honest with you, in my four years as a, as the city manager, I've never actually settled a claim before, so I, I wouldn't say it's been an issue. Um, but what we did on that one was again we we looked across comparables. 
and we just took the amounts so that we were in the same ballpark as the others. And it, it did actually surprise me how similar. I think these are amounts that are used almost across the board for the most part. So just okay. an inflationary increase, but I wouldn't say there was an issue. Okay, the only question, thanks. Okay, thank you. I had uh, two questions, 4.4B, uh, just determine salaries. So I think you just need to tweak that a little bit uh, as, and, and maybe just put in there, determine salaries and benefits as per whatever council policy is regarding that, because you can't just set, you can't just set a salary without referring back to another policy. Yeah, and through your worship, it does that. I re looked that one up. It does say um, uh, determine salaries, benefits, and hours of work and other working conditions in accordance with established council and administrative policy. So, um, council does have a non union um, okay. compensation policy in place. So, that, that would apply and be. Okay, sorry, I just misread that. No, the other one that I had was 4.8, where it talks about uh, if the city manager is unable to designate an acting city manager, you've got council may by resolution appoint a acting city manager uh, in the event of incapacity, uh, long term illness, etc. Wouldn't that be shall because it would have to be by resolution? Um, yeah, through your worship, maybe what I'll do, I think the, the May is probably with respect to the type of absence. So like when I go on vacation, I just appoint. Um, but I do agree with you that in those cases that it lists there, such as incapacity or long-term illness, um, that it would be council that would actually do the appointing in those cases. So I can take a look at that and maybe try to distinguish between the two. Yeah, I, it was just one small word. That, uh, but other than that, I was fine with it as well. Okay, uh, okay, I see a hand there. Um, does uh, anybody else require round two? Okay, I'm gonna go round two. Uh, Councillor Lennox, anything? Nothing. Councillor Macon, you're good. Councillor Kelly? Yes, thank okay. you. Just a small point of clarification. 4.40 talks about fees and charges for customer service related matters. Customer service related matter by definition wouldn't include property taxes, yes or no? I would say no, but I, I think um, I'll probably take another look at the wording anyway, just to see if we can add some clarity to that. But I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't see a customer service uh, matter, although somebody could try to spin it that way. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Councillor Batoye. Anything? You're good. Your screen is spinning. Are you good? Okay. All right. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Well, I guess to your question, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, the Municipal Government Act uh, would lay out certain requirements for Council to do certain things that uh, is above the uh, city manager's bylaw. So if it's if it's provided there, I don't think we have to necessarily have it here. So I think what what the city manager was talking about the uh, discretionary clause uh, certainly makes sense, unless it's unless it's not provided provided for. And I haven't looked at the MGA, and you know that's other people are concerned about that stuff more so than I am. But that's what I would say. We don't need to recreate the wheel if it's already contained in the legislation. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. Anything further? Just one more uh, question on uh, four point four point four p. Um, do you want to put a cap on that, or just do you want to leave that open ended in terms of um, the use of granted uh, the use? Of actually, I don't think that's not the one I'm referring to. It's actually four point four o. So waive at discretion on a one-time basis, fees and charges for customer service related matters. So would you put a cap on that or would you just leave it open-ended? Yeah, through your worship, I hadn't contemplated that, but uh, that's actually a good point too. Let me um, let me take that one back and consider it. Because okay. I do agree with you if we were talking about a five figure refund of some kind or like you're right, there, there should be some involvement of council and that would probably be a serious matter, so. 
Okay. Um, I'll Thanks. take a look. Okay, good. So I think there's just a few, maybe minor, um, I think very few minor ones. So we'll leave that one with you. And if you think it uh, can make the one for next next week, that will be fine. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, are there any councillor inquiries? I'll just look for a show of hands. Hey, okay, Councillor Lennox. I'm just wondering, I just want to ask administration if it would be possible given all the discussion and the work um, that you're undertaking over this next year and have been in regards to the asset management and service level policy of what it would take to incorporate that into the council orientation for, for this year. Um, through your worship, we're actually going to be having a discussion with council. This is our plan right now. I'm, we haven't totally nailed it down, but it's the tentative agenda agenda for the February 2nd council retreat. We were gonna um, sort of show a draft plan for the council orientation and get feedback from council. Um, so we can uh, uh, we can incorporate your question now, take a look at that now, and then discuss it further on February 2nd. Perfect, thanks. That's yeah. it. I thought you're all excited. I, I don't see any other hands for councillor inquiries. So, oh, go ahead, councillor Kelly. Yeah, sorry, Mayor Catcher. Um, councillor Lennox's question twigged my memory bank. We just recently received by distribution, Troy, uh, an updated, I think it's an updated studies list for 2020. I think that's what it was called, which gave a, a chronological history of the consultants reports that the city has received. I think reference to that specifically in the council orientation would make sense as well. And and just so you note it for discussion in February and I don't forget it. Uh, we can make note of that. Okay, thank you. So no additional council inquiries. So with that, we do have to go in camera. We do have an in-camera portion uh, as per um, uh, uh, FOI, Freedom of Information. So with that, I will take a motion to go in camera. Councillor Macon, that would be you. Would you like to make that motion? Sure. I'll make the motion that we go in camera. Thank you. Motion should be up on your screens. Please cast your vote. Yes, for me, Mary Ketcher, I've already moved to the other agenda. Sorry. Did you get, okay, that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. We'll take a uh, five minute recess just so they can make sure everything's shut off and then we will get into this. So, so, so about seven, just after 7.40.